right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for the gift of today. Um, thank you for the ability to study your word. I pray, pray that you help us have a great uh, discussion today. I pray that you open our minds to the scriptures. I pray that we would think your thoughts after you. We pray that our lives would bring you honor uh, in the world today. And pray, Lord, that you give us a taste, a foreshadow um, of the glory of the promises that you've given in your new covenant. Uh, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe, is it not, that after today, we only have four weeks left of class. Is it, how crazy is that? Um, this uh, 12... Uh, sections after today, so it's pretty amazing. I will use that as a um, reminder, be working on the memory verse. You don't want to leave that till the very end, uh, so um, start working on that a little now. And if you guys wouldn't mind starting the sign-in sheet, uh, I think it's uh, over there. Um, so what we're going to look at today is Psalm 1 and 2. Uh, Psalm 1 and 2 and biblical theology, a whole Bible biblical theology. Uh, we've looked at one of the Psalms, uh, Psalm 22. We saw the Christocentric nature of that. We want to step back today and take a little bit bigger look at all the Psalms, and in particular Psalm 1 and 2 that in many ways functions as a preface to the entire uh, Psalter. So as we look at that uh, today, these two Psalms, I would suggest, and I don't think I'm the only one who would put it this way, but I would suggest that Psalm 1 and 2 are like two doors that together are the entryway to the Psalter. Um, I think it's O. Palmer Robertson who came up with the idea of Psalm 1 being a, the Torah door of the Psalter. That is, looking at the Psalter through the lens of the Torah. Uh, Psalm 1 talks about the blessedness of the man who delights in the Torah of the Lord. And so you can, if you think of the Psalter, the 150 Psalms in the Psalter, uh, the entryway, the, the door that helps you understand all the Psalms will be Psalm 1 in the Torah door. And it's possible to call Psalm 2 the prophecy door. Um, in many ways, there are some features in Psalm 2 that are really weird, but once you conceive of Psalm 2 as somehow connected with the later prophecies, a lot of the unusual nature of Psalm 2 will start to make a lot of sense. So as we look at this, I'm looking at Psalm 1 and 2 uh, together as kind of the entryway, the invitation to all 150 uh, Psalms that make up the uh, Psalter. And in many ways, Psalm 1 is uh, pretty straightforward. Blesses is a man who does not walk, stand, or sit in the way of people who are opposed to God. Um, uh, the blessed man, the blessed person, um, is choosing God over uh, the ideals of the word. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's pretty straightforward that he delights constantly, that he meditates over and over uh, on the Torah of the Lord. Uh, the Torah of the Lord, uh, we're told in, I think it's Deuteronomy 17, that uh, uh, if a person was a king in Israel, 
that that king should write out a hand copy of the Torah. It takes about a year to do that. Uh, if a person was going to be a king in Israel, they were commanded to make their own personal copy and to carry it around and read from it every day of their uh, lives. So the blessed man and the kind of ideal king in Deuteronomy are uh, connected in that their life is one of constant uh, delighting and a constant meditating on the Lord's Torah. And that person, we're told, is like the tree of life or like a tree of life, we might say, like a tree planted by the streams of water that clearly is picking up uh, language from the Garden of Eden. So this person is going to be like the tree of life that was in Eden. Now, when I say all that's straightforward, it is straightforward except for one point, and that one point has to do with how you translate the verse. Is it translated, blessed is a man who does not walk, d does not stand, does not sit, or should it be translated, blessed is a man who did not walk, or blessed is a man who has not walked, or another way we might translate it, blessed is the man who has never walked in the way of the wicked. Now that's a pretty big difference in translation, is it not? What, what do you see as the major difference? So blessed is the man who does not walk versus blessed is the man who has not walked. What's the difference? Isaiah? If he does not do it, it's something he's not doing right now. But if he hasn't done it, then he's never going to do it. Right. So the difference is um, blessed is the man who does not would, at least in English, be describing a person whose life currently uh, isn't engaged in uh, uh, consorting with the wicked. But if you translate it, blessed man who has not, that implies the person has never done it, right? That's a pretty big difference is it not? So when there's a difference in translation, what do we as believers need to do? If you, if you have major translations that differ on specific words, what is our responsibility as a believer? What is our responsibility as a believer? <laughs> Uh, to, to track it down, to see, like, which way should we go with this. And that's what we should do today, is it not? These are some major translations. So the ESV says, blessed is the man who walks not. So they're going with the translation uh, does not. So uh, blessed is a man whose life, or we might do what many uh, translations do, blessed is the person whose life uh, is not ca currently characterized as walking in the way of the wicked. Now it's interesting when we look at ancient translations, this is how the ancient translations do it. So I have one here that says LXX. Uh, wh what, what is that? LXX, ancient translation. Do you recognize that's Roman numeral for 70? So 
whenever you see LXX, they're telling you what the Septuagint translated it. And uh, we have access to the Septuagint. We have access to an English, a very good English translation of the Septuagint called the New English Translation of the Septuagint. And the Septuagint goes, happy is the man who did not walk. So the Septuagint is going with, blessed is the man whose life has never been characterized by walking in the way of the wicked. Uh, Theodosian, um, you may or may not know, but there were multiple Greek translations in antiquity, and Theodosian is a major one, and Theodosian translated, perfect is the man who has not departed. Other Greek uh, ancient translations go, blessed is the man who has not transgressed. The Psalm Targum, which is the Aramaic translation of the uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, so done by Jews for Jews, the Psalm Targum translated, happy is the man who has not walked. Uh, D-R-A, does anybody know who, uh, what uh, translation D-R-A would be? So D-R-A is Dewey Rheims Apocrypha, which is the Latin Vulgate's translation. And so the Latin Vulgate translates it, who has not walked. Uh, Euxta Hebraeus, uh, Jerome translated the Old Testament into uh, Latin, and he was living in Bethlehem when he did it, and over the five years it took him to make that translation, he learned Hebrew, and Euxta Hebraeus is his revision of the Vulgate. And he translates it, blessed is the man who has not departed. And then the Syriac uh, Peshitta, um, uh, done by Semitic speaking people, translates it, blessed is the man who has not walked. And all of these translations are trying to get at this, uh, sorry, this one word, halak. And there are some people here who've taken uh, Hebrew. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Can you tell me, is that a perfect or an imperfect uh, uh, halak? Uh, yeah, it's, perfect. it's a perfect. And what can you tell me about a Hebrew perfect? It's something that's already been accomplished. Now, if that's true, I just want to ask, ask a candid question of all, all of us, myself included. Would this sentence, blessed is the man, man or woman, whose life is characterized by never having walked in the counsel of the wicked. Does that apply to your life? Uh, someone looks at the totality of your life and they say, from the moment you came into existence until this present second, the totality of your life is described by never having walked in the counsel of the wicked. Um, I'm not going to make that claim. So help me. This this would seem. This would seem to exclude people from blessing. Who have walked in the counsel of the wicked. How would you define walking in the counsel of the wicked? Uh, Isaiah, that's a very good question. Uh, could, could I ask you, how, how would you define? It seems different than outright sin. So you can come to me with taking a Bible from you if you are acting to another human being and doing something as opposed to just sinning on your own. 
You mean like if somebody came and said, hey, I know God said do this, but if you want to be happy, don't follow God, do this. Did anybody in the Bible face that uh, situation where they were being told by someone, don't do it God's way? It's Adam, right? So is Adam the blessed man, would you think? Was Adam a tree of life? Did any of Adam's natural offspring live a life that could be completely characterized by never having walked in the counsel of the wicked? Well, I'm kind of depressed. I thought we were supposed to, you know, come to the Bible and like be cheered up. This, this is like co- condemnation. How if if someone is the Torah door into the praises of the Psalter, and on that door it says, "Keep out all those who have failed to live a life completely conforming to God's will." How is this going to be good news to me? Can you think of anyone in Scripture of whom the statement, Asherai Haish, Esher Elo Halak, Ba'it Sath Reshaim, blessed is the, is the person who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked. Does that apply to anyone in scripture? Who does it apply to, Parker? It applies to Jesus. Did Jesus ever sin in thought, word, or deed? Did Jesus at every occasion say, I know in my, in my human nature, I, I feel what it's like not wanting to go to the cross, but what did Jesus say? Yet not, what did Jesus say? Yet not my will, but your will be done. And do you remember in the story where he was when he said that? He's praying. His human nature doesn't want to endure the suffering of the cross. And he says, yet not my will, but your will be done. Do you know where he said that in the story? Oh, he he was in a garden? Oh, he was in a garden when he said that? Did somebody else face that temptation in a garden and go the other way? You see, if we translate it, blessed is the man who does not walk, that gives me the irrational assumption that I might be that blessed man. But if we translate it, blessed is a man who has not walked, I can be under no illusion that that text applies to me. Words and the translations of words are important. And I think the translation of this word is very important. Uh, And if... Uh, I had the good fortune to talk to anyone who's going to be on the uh, ESV revision committee. Oh my goodness, how I would plead for us to translate this not as a present continual, but as what it is in the Hebrew as a perfect. And I would cite that seven major ancient translations side with did not walk. And it's not just the ancient ones. Oh, 
uh, do, do you know where you have to go to find out what the ancient ones uh, trans? You have to go to a book, uh, uh, Origins Hexaplo. And uh, this edition of the Hexplo is edited by Montfaucon. And um, it was published in 1770. So there's been no modern edition. And I suppose the reason is it's all in Greek and Hebrew and Syriac. And the easy parts are in abbreviated Latin. It's like, oh my goodness, uh, why, why, why didn't somebody make it a little easier? And I'm told that uh, Phoenix Seminary is actually working on an update to this, but uh, it tells me, Montfaucon says, oh, the blessings, or blesses the, um, the man uh, who never has walked. Uh, uh, Theodosian, uh, column five, and uh, I guess that's Symmachus. Perfect is the young man who has not departed. Others say, blessed is the man who did not uh, stray. So all the ancient translations are in agreement. It should be translated as a past tense. And even some of our modern translations do it. Young's literal translation says, Oh, the happiness of that one who hath not walked. Or uh, this is the Word Bible commentary, very uh, respected uh, commentary series. Um, uh, my mentor was actually the editor of the New Testament version of the word biblical commentary, very, very respected. But this is the most recent volume of the Psalms by Peter Craigie and others. And he translates our verse, blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked and has not stood in the way of sin the sinful people and has not sat in the gathering of scoffers, but in the Lord's Torah is his constant delight. All the ones in uh, verse 1 are perfects. The ones in verse 2 are imperfects, which are present continuals, uh, I, I would argue. Uh, he will be like a tree tr transplanted by running waters, or planted is how I would do it, which shall lead yield its fruit in its season. That's all Genesis 1, Garden of Eden language. The person who obeys the law will be like the tree of life. And uh, can, can you see the whole difference between a Christocentric and a non-Christocentric approach to this psalm? Uh, a non-Christocentric says, hey, just obey God's law and you'll be the tree of life, which would be a great thing if we were perfectly conformed to God's will. And yet, who is perfectly conformed to God's will? And the scriptures would say, well, Jesus is perfectly, and Jesus becomes a tree of life to those who come to him. Now, <coughs> excuse me, what did we call Psalm 1? Psalm 1 is the what to the Psalter? What did we call it? The Torah door. What did we call Psalm 2? The prophecy door. Psalm 1 and 2 are connected, and I just want to point out some weird things uh, to you. Do you not notice that Psalm 1 starts the same exact way that Psalm 2 ends. Blesses man who has not. And blessed are all those taking refuge in him. So in Hebrew, that's called an inclusio. Uh, some very good modern literature will do that, where you, you have a line, 
and then you have important stuff, and then at the very end you have a similar line, and those lines are the same. That's called an inclusio or an inclusion, and it's saying read these two together. Uh, that's why I'm arguing that these two are the joint doors that you enter in to the whole Psalter through these two doors. Psalm 1 talks about the blessed man. Psalm 2 talks about the Lord's Messiah. Now, what's interesting uh, about this is this word son uh, in the last verse of Psalm 2, and I put that in red, and then I have uh, you are my son, and I put that one in blue. Now, is there an intelligent reader question you might ask of me when I put up this translation of Psalm 1 and 2, and I have the word son in two different colors? Is, is there an intelligent reader question you might ask of me? So the red one, and, and there's no way to see this in an English translation, the red one is not written in Hebrew. It's written in another language. So this one is written in Hebrew. You, you are my son, my Ben. Uh, Benny is the actual word, my son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's written in Hebrew. This version of the word son is not written in Hebrew. Do you have an intelligent reader question that you might want to ask? What language is it written in? It's written in Aramaic. D do you have a follow-up question? Yeah. Why? Why is it written in... And let me try some possible uh, uh, explanations. Nothing to see here. Move on. Don't ask questions like that. There's... Uh, it's... It's not important. I mean, don't you have occasions where you're talking at the lunch table and in our ain ha logos and you say, better sheep bara Elohim, and wow, it's really pretty outside. Ik be nine Berlin. Don't you have conversations like that all the time where you go in and out of several languages? Oh, you don't? Yeah, me either. <laughs> I know people who are fluent in language who will do that, but that's never been my experience to go in and out of two different languages. So why would you write a word in another language unless there's something important about it being in another language? What can you tell me about Aramaic? Do you, do you know that there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible and that, uh, what is it? Uh, it's uh, two, 269 of them are written in Greek. Um, what is it? Nine. Is it 929 are in Hebrew and 7 are in Aramaic? Don't you want to ask the question, why are this, what's the deal about the 7 that are in Aramaic? And there, I, th I think there are like 260 verses all total that are written in Aramaic. And like, in, in Jeremiah, you're reading along, and all of a sudden he he writes 
a whole verse in Aramaic. Uh, I don't know. Do you have a minute for a rabbit trail? Uh, who's ever heard of the term an at-bash code? You ever heard of the term at-bash code? It's pretty cool. What you do is, is write out the alphabet in order, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then write out the alphabet in the reverse order, Z, uh, X, Y. Like, I can't even do that, but write it out all the way where A is the last one. And an Atbash code is where instead of writing it in forward English, you write it with the backward alphabet. At bash, it comes from the Hebrew. Uh, Aleph, Tav, uh, Beit, uh, Shin. So it's like you take the Hebrew alphabet and if you write it backwards, you, you can do a code. It's called an at bash code. People use it. Uh, all the time. Did you know there are two sentences in the Bible that are written in an Atbash code? And that both versions of the sentences say something? Now think about that. Could you do that in English? Like where, where you had a sentence like, I love my cat or something and then that exact sentence, if you assume it's written in an Atbash code, would have another sentence hidden inside of it that was an intelligible sentence. I don't think I could do that if my life depended on it. There are two verses in the, um, I think it's chapter 49 of Jeremiah, that are written in an Atbash code that makes sense either way you read it. Why did the psalmist write the word son in a different language unless there was some significant meaning? Well, I know in Daniel there's this mysterious figure called the Barnashah, uh, the son of man who comes into the presence of the Lord and the Lord said, let all the uh, nations of the world uh, serve him and the Ten Commandments says only serve God so you've got this second figure who comes in and God says I want you to worship and serve this second figure and I know that Jesus when he was tried he quoted that verse and he said that verse applies to me and the high priest ripped his uh, clothes and said you have to die, you've committed blasphemy. He quotes a verse uh, in the Aramaic section in Daniel, and he says, that is me. And the high priest says, blasphemy. Well, isn't it interesting that this Aramaic son is the Messiah of Psalm 2? And that the Messiah of Psalm 2 that God says you are my son today I've begotten you do you remember that conversation you had with your mom and dad when they discussed with you what your name should be you remember that conversation when you were born you know you were born and they said uh, do, you know what do you want do you remember that conversation yeah, me either. Like, I didn't talk to my parents. It took year, you know, months and months. This person is talking to their parent the day they were begotten. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a 
potter's vessel. This verse is quoted in Revelation 19 and applied to Jesus uh, if, if we had time, we could look at it, but there are two different ways that you can translate this, you will break them. You can translate it, you will break them. You could also translate it, you will shepherd them. It's interesting that Revelation 19 has both of those translations. John was reading Psalm 2 and applying it to Jesus. Now, therefore, kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord. And so, in Hebrew, what is the word there, uh, Lord? Is it going to be the tetragrammaton? Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice before him with trembling. Kiss the son. Aramaic lest he be angry. Who is the he there? Who is the he in lest he be angry? It's the son, right? Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath. Who's the his? It's the son, right? His wrath is quickly kindled blessed are all who take refuge in him who is the him grammatically it's the son is it not uh, when I took uh, Hebrew uh, at uh, Georgia 40 years ago um, my Hebrew teacher had just graduated from Yale uh, I think it I think our class may have been the first class he ever taught uh, if it wasn't the first it was very close to the first and when he taught the class he was an up-and-coming scholar and by the time he died, he was the most famous psalm commentator in the world. Uh, it's interesting, when I graduated, uh, the, uh, they held the graduation on the Georgia football field there, and they let the um, teachers come out and find the people who graduated. There were 5,000 people who graduated my class, and he found me, and he sat next to me in the graduation. I thought that was kind of cool, you know, this uh, guy who had gone to Yale. Um, by the time he wrote the book that made him famous on the editing of the Psalter, um, he came to this verse and said, grammatically, the take refuge in him grammatically it's the son but my professor said it can't mean that because when you read the entire Psalter it says over and over don't take refuge in man only take refuge in YHWH And so Dr. Wilson said, even though grammatically it should be refuge in him, it, it has to be, the him has to be the Lord. Well, Dr. Wilson died very young. Uh, he was in his early 50s uh, when he died. And since he died, people have said, well, no, the him is the sun, but maybe what's happening is early in this altar, you have hope in the Davidic king, but as it progresses, the figure of the king and the Lord are actually merging. And that's exactly what happens in Daniel, is it not? 
this psalm is not about David. This psalm was never about David. Because David isn't the blessed man. David did not meditate on the Torah of the Lord day and night. David was, ask his kids, David was not like a tree planted by the streams of water. And because David is not this man, David is not the anointed one of Psalm 2. He's not the king. He's not the eternal son. And he's not the one in whom other people can take refuge. And you say, well, how do you know that's true? Well, and I can thank Dr. Wilson for this. How does Psalm 3 start? What, what's the preface of Psalm 3? Psalm 3 tells you something about David's life. What does the preface of Psalm 3 say? This is the psalm that David wrote when what happened? Fled from his son Absalom. When did he flee from his son, son Absalom? After he tried to kill him. Why did he try to kill him? He wanted power, but there was something that happened in David's life that led to Absalom's rebellion. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah. And God told him, you did this in secret. This punishment's going to be public. David, and we're told in Psalm 72 that all these are David's prayers. David knew that he wasn't the blessed man because he puts the psalm in Psalm 3 that of all psalms exposes his own sin. He wasn't a tree planted by the streams of water. He, he didn't, you couldn't say of David, whatever he does prospers. He's running for his life from his own son. But David, and we're told these are David's prayers. David prayed through these. These are the two doors that open the Psalter. David was looking to, to a better David. David was looking to the Messiah, and David was taking refuge in him. And I think if you think of the Torah door and the prophet prophetic door, that's our entry into reading all the Psalms. Augustine takes this view uh, about the past tense. He says this statement should be understood as referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Lord man who has not gone astray, as did the earthly man who conspired with his wife, already beguiled by the serpent to disregard God's commandments. Christ most certainly came in the way of sinners by being born as his sinners are, but he did not stand in it, for worldly allurement did not hold him. If these two psalms are the Torah door and the prophecy door, then how should we read the psalms? Because many people will come to Psalm 1 and say, blessed is the man who does not walk, and the sermon will be, hey, this coming week, don't walk in the way of the wicked. And they uh, might apply it, you know, don't spend your time on TikTok and YouTube and, you know, don't uh, go, go into social media. If you want to be blessed, uh, just don't uh, cavort with uh, people who are living in an anti-God way. Was well, that ever worked for you? Like uh, the preacher says, just 
just try harder, just pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps, just double down, strengthen your resolve. Well, what about coming to the Lord and saying, I'm not the Adam who's going to do this. I never was the Adam. I need faith. I don't have faith. I, I need you to, to come to a bad tree and make it a good tree and then for the, the Spirit of God in, in this renewal to work the fruit of faith and repentance. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. Um, I'm just going to go forward to a, a slide just to make a point. Um, Sorry, I talked so s s slow and we didn't get to this, but if I can find, yeah. So we've got this inclusio, blessed is the man, blessed are all those taking refuge in him, in him, that is the messianic king. Does that verse, blessed is the man, sound like anything else in the Bible to you? If I say blessed is the man who has not walked, does that sound like any other Bible verse you know of? It, it may be that it's easier to see in the original language. How about this? So, this is our uh, Oh, the Blessings of the, the Man. Anybody who's had Greek, does, does this statement, makarios, aner, has, uk, ep, does that sound like anything you've ever read? It sounds like the Beatitudes. It sounds like the Beatitudes. In fact, it's exactly the same as the Beatitudes. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he starts it off with quoting an echo of Psalm 1. How does he start that Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the what? What's the first Beatitude? It's usually translated, blessed are the poor in spirit. Is there another way to translate that? Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Spiritually bankrupt. Uh, this word poor, like there are levels of poverty. This is like homeless person, penniless, begging on the street to make it. Do you see what Jesus has done? Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Can any of us be the blessed man of Psalm 1? No. The, the requirement is a life completely characterized by conformity to God's will. But... The end of Psalm 2, which is in the Ecclesio, says, Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Well, the him is the messianic king who is the blessed man. And Jesus is saying, I am that blessed man. I am that messianic king. I am the new David. And Matthew, who's in the audience... Uh, this is the sermon he was converted at. Uh, he's the only one who writes it down word for word. It was where he first heard the good news. Matthew realized that he couldn't be the blessed man of Psalm 1, but he realized that Jesus was, and he took refuge in him and the connection with the new covenant. Uh, and we're going to look at next time Ezekiel 36.
I think, starts to make all of this uh, make sense. I hope you have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.